just a, a, a quick thing that, that upset me during the week because it's, um, uh, it, it's kind of what we're going through, every one of us as Christians in these last days. Um, and at all my time at the pulpit uh, from 1997, it's never happened. Last time, uh, because we're a, 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 a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church, and uh, I don't um, uh, resile from anything that is in the scripture, and I give it to you uh, as plainly and as bluntly as, as I can. And I try and make the gospel part of the message every week. And so that um, antagonizes the other side, if you understand the dark side, especially when we have been doing the, the series of Jude, because you're talking about the enemies of the Christian church. And, um, and our prayer warriors were out there uh, last week and they couldn't even pray. They were waiting for an avalanche like a tsunami. And the attack was amazing. And that first five minutes um, of last week's message, I didn't even know where my brain was until he, I just said, Lord, restore it and let's go. So what we really need is we don't want organised prayer but Sue and I live by your prayers for us because we are constantly under attack. You would not believe what goes on in our life during the week. But um, Jesus is, has also already won the victory for us. But uh, we need um, constant um, uh, vigilance because not only us, but every Christian is under attack at the moment. And it's just it's a sign of the times. And so this message itself is, is so, this is the um, resurrection one. And that particular verse there, that's absolutely fascinating. Uh, and I asked John to make that particularly um, prominent because it is the theme of this, uh, this message. And the theme is victory through Christ. And I'm just going to start off now with 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. And verse 15 is this. Paul is talking to the Corinthian church. Do you know some of the most amazing doctrinal revelations that Paul gives to the church over the last 2,000 years was given to the Corinthian church? Can you imagine that? It was one of the worst behaved churches in the entire New Testament. But he gave them such amazing revelation. Uh, and in these few, first few verses, he, he says this, Now I make known unto you, brethren, the gospel which I preached unto you and which you also received. Now that received, he's talking to brethren, so they received, they accepted the gospel. These people are saved. Wherein also you stand, by which you are also saved, if, and that's a first class condition because they do, ye hold the fast the word which I preached unto you. And here's a uh, final phrase that really upsets many of the commentators. Except ye believed in vain. And so they've received, they, they, their brethren, they've received the gospel, they stand in the gospel, they know that they are saved. And Paul puts this strange thing here except you believed in vain. And that is not the fault of the Corinthian audience. Do you understand? Paul is saying, if I've come to you as a fraud and taught you a false gospel and you've believed what I've asked you and it's not true, then your faith is in vain. Do you understand? That's the, that's the big uh, problem with people uh, exegeting that particular um, uh, verse. And so I want you to understand that. But later on in the same uh, chapter, you get this, 12 to 19. Now, if Christ has preached that he hath been raised from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? And boy, in all my research, my other research this week, you have got no idea in liberal Christian theology in the last 20 or 30 years, especially after the World War II, in, in seminaries all around the world, the fact that the resurrection is now under brutal assault by liberal theologians. It's just amazing that we, I, I must live in a cocoon because this here is my standard of belief. Do you understand? And that is what I live by. But if you're going to call yourself a Christian 
and not believe the word of God, you're in serious trouble. You are in serious trouble. What did Jesus, all the way through our study of Matthew, call the Pharisees and Sadducees? Hypocrites. Hypocrites. One face on Sunday in in church, the other face as a demon during the week. That's what a hypocrite is. It's a Greek author that, sorry, actor, that would have two or three masks to take different roles in a Greek play. That's what they used to do. And that's where the word comes from, hypocrites. It means that you've done one one, um, uh, personality, you rush away and you get the other mask and you become a, a different person, a different character. And that is not what God wants from us. We should be the Christian on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and 24 hours a day. And, and this is the thing that Paul is trying to get across to them now. Now, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, neither has Christ been raised. And if Christ has not been raised then our preaching is in vain. And that word vain, if you're ever reading the New Testament, the word vain means empty or worthless. Empty or worthless. Your faith also is in vain. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God. He's expanding on that last phrase that I, that I taught you just before. Because we witnessed of God that he raised Christ, Christ up whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, neither has Christ been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is in vain. It's empty. It's worthless. And look at the punctuation there. Semicolon. Stop there. But this is the best thing yet. Yet ye are in your sins. Then they also that are fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have only hoped in Christ, in Christ in this life, we are of all men most pitiable. And I cannot emphasize enough to you today that the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is the make or break of your faith. If you want to walk around it, dodge it, ignore it, pull back from it, come and see me. Because I'll give you some personal um, teaching, very kindly, very warmly. Sue might even provide um, um, cake and I'll provide the coffee. But believe me, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the make or break of our faith. It is the fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith. Because without the resurrection, Paul tells not only the Corinthian church, but us here today... And every believer who has come to faith in Jesus that we are in and remain in our sins. And that's not so. I hope, who here does not uh, remain in their sins? Who here has believed in Jesus Christ? And who here is heading for heaven very shortly? Oh yeah, half of you put up your hands. That's that's (laughs) wonderful. Um, We'll try and drag the rest of you up with us. Without the resurrection, Jesus would be just another Old Testament prophet. Isaiah is still dead, as is Jeremiah, so is Ezekiel, so is Daniel, so is Hosea, and Joel, all the way to Malachi. John the Baptist would have had no hope and no future, and neither would we. But Jesus was adamant to his disciples that he was and is the way, the truth, and the what? The life. Let us look at what Jesus said to his disciples, recorded several times in the Gospels, starting with Matthew concerning this whole uh, issue. Matthew 16, 21. This is when they're on uh, uh, at Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, about to go up to the Mount of Transfiguration. And this is the first time he's warning them with the words from his own mouth. Verse 21. From that time, Jesus... Uh, began to show unto his disciples that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed, comma, and the third day be raised up. And I want you to understand, in my notes, that's heavily emphasized. And on the third day be raised up. He told these 
people who have been wish with him for three years plus, and they listen to him. But do you know what? Until the day of Pentecost, it went. Phew. It went until they saw him in, in the in, in his uh, um, resurrected body, and this this warning that he started in in Matthew 16 that he will be raised up on the third day is recorded in Mark 8, 9, and Luke 9. But it's here again amplified by uh, Matthew in verse 20. Verses 20, 17 to 9, sorry, chapter 20, verses 17 and 19. And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, this is the last journey from Jesus. He's gone uh, from east of the Jordan. He's crossed the Jordan. He's gone into Jericho. He's saved um, Zacchaeus. Remember Zacchaeus? the little pint-sized chief uh, tax collector who could only see Jesus if he climbed up a tree and he called him down, went into his house and got him saved. This is the journey that Jesus is uh, being recorded here. And he said this. As he was going up to Jerusalem, up to Jerusalem, so this is from the plain of Jericho and he's climbing up, he took the 12 disciples apart. Why did he take them apart? Because if you have been just in Jericho and you have just, just saved Zacchaeus, a lot of people have decided to walk after you and follow you. Not because they believe in him, but they're fascinated by him. And so he's going to Jerusalem and it's the start of um, the Pesach uh, period of the, the calendar. And so he took the 12 disciples apart, and on the way he said to them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and scribes. He said that before. And they shall condemn him to death, and they said that before, and shall deliver him up to the Gentiles first time to mock and to scourge and to crucify, colon, and the third day he shall be raised up. And, you know, I, I, I put myself in, in the situation of the disciples. Jesus was their hope, their strength, their shield, their buckler, everything. And now he's telling them, I'm going to die. But on the third day, I'm going to be resurrected. The disciples had no reasonable excuse to refuse to believe all that Jesus spoke of. Why? Because they were scholars of the Old Testament, the Tanakh. You know, we often think that um, Jewish uh, fishermen around the Sea of Galilee, like um, Peter, John, James, and Andrew, that they were just ignorant um, um, fishermen. They weren't. Every single one of them started in synagogue at the age of five. And they got the Old Testament, what we call the Tanakh, especially the Torah, pushed into them for the rest of their life. They knew the scriptures. They could recite them. But did they often understand them? No. Because until you and I and they, they are filled with the Holy Spirit, we do not get the illumination that we read in the Bible. And so... but. It was in the Old Testament. Resurrection was recorded in Genesis chapter 22 with the offering of Isaac by Abraham. As he, Abraham, believed God that he would have innumerable descendants through his promised son, Isaac, and this from Genesis 15. So in, in the Akedah, up on Mount Zion, on the, on the altar... Abram held a knife ready to plunge into Isaac on the altar till Jesus called out to him to halt. And Abraham was convinced that because of the divine promise of descendants through Isaac, that God was obliged to resurrect Isaac to life. Do you understand? He, I've got a beautiful son, I've got a beautiful grandson, and now I've got a tiny another grandson. I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. But the faith of Abraham impelled him to do that. Why? Because he believed God in Genesis 15. And he took him outside the tent, showed him the stars of the sky, and said, so shall your descendants be. So there was the first um, promise of, uh, of resurrection in the Bible. It was also recorded in Job 19, 25 to 27. It's my favorite um, memory uh, verse. I know that my Redeemer lives and that he will stand on the earth at the last and that even though worms eat this body, 
yet in my flesh I shall see him. That's in Job. Same time period as Abraham. The resurrection is not a New Testament amazement. It's been there since the very beginning. And it's also in Isaiah 26, 19, thy dead man shall live. Together with my dead body, they shall arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust. For thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Daniel 12, 2, and it's in 13. I'm only going to do verse 2. And many of them that dwell in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting contempt. And the last one, this is the one I really like, Hosea 13, 14. It's much less quoted, so I'm going to um, read it out to you from the, from the verse. Hosea 13, 14. I will rent, this is, by the way, God's promise to Israel for the millennial kingdom. I will ransom them, the Israelites, from the power of Sheol. I will redeem them from death. And you should be kind of familiar what I'm just about to, to speak out. O death, where are thy plagues? O Sheol, where is thy destruction? And Paul repeats that in verse 55 in 1 Corinthians 50. He says, O death, where is your sting? Grave is where your... Um, I forget the other one. But when you see the two different interpretations, the one is the Masoretic text that we get in the New Testament, but when they quote the Old Testament in the New Testament, that's the Septuagint, and this is the Septuagint. Given this cast iron guarantee of the resurrection for you and I, I must make it clear to you and to warn you to be aware of this, that the raising of Christ from the dead now has strong opposition within liberal, liberal, please, please, I hate the word liberal. I hate the word that, that um, uh, good pastors and teachers around the world, especially in, um, uh, in America, they use the word liberal or progressives for the enemies of Christ. And I tell you what, they're neither liberal nor are they progressive. Do you understand? It, it, you've got to be very careful with the words that you use to describe people. And, and you know, I, when, when we're dealing in Jude with apostates, I tell you what, there's an army of demons out there that are ready to belt you around the head. But I'm, I'm just telling you this, that liberal and neo-Orthodox Christian teachings in seminaries all around, mainly in the Western uh, Hemisphere, that indeed Christ did not rise bodily, but only, listen to this, spiritually. Spiritually. And I'm not going to, to focus on this because the rest of the message is the glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ. But I'm going to be sensitive in this, in this next statement that in Latin Christianity, and I'm being you know, cautious here, the cross and the plethora of crucifixes adorning their churches and their dress code has glorified death and diminished the bodily resurrection almost to theological invisibility. You know the people I'm, I'm talking about and the, the finery that they walk in and they've got a crucifix that must weigh 10 kilos around their neck? The other influence is that if you have in your theology two redeemers in heaven, namely Jesus and Mary, it explains the diminishing of Jesus' rising from the dead, which is clearly revealed in the scripture, and to add insult to injuries, the proponents of this heresy then move from there to attack the truth and the veracity of the Bible in nearly every other area. You make one mistake, you've got to make another one and another one and another one to keep covering your tracks. Jesus' bodily resurrection from the dead is the absolute proof of the personhood of Jesus. And I stuck personhood in there deliberately. Why? Because it's the divine and the human together. It's the divine and the, and, and the human together. That's the personhood of Jesus. His deity, his messiahship, his resultant power to save from sin. The infallibility of the scriptures, listen to this, demands 
the fulfillment of the fulfillment of the promises that Jesus personally made to his disciples as his first advent nears the end. And I will be raised up on the third day. Did they hear it? No. They did, they listened to it, but they couldn't understand it. And the resurrection itself also paves the way for the orderly progression of the fulfillment of the prophecy as to Christ then and to his glorification. And step one was his resurrection, and it's proven by several uh, effects, and I'm going to show them to you in, in a numerical order. His resurrection is proven by the empty ter- uh, tomb, John 20, verses 1 and 2. And John 20, verse 1, it says, Now on the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early. I was in a bit of a King James American Standard Version this week. That's why uh, I'm sort of hathing and becoming and begotting and all the rest of it. I get those moods. Sometimes I get sick and tired of the modern translations and I like, I like to go back to the bedrock uh, early. And while it was yet dark unto the tomb, and she seeth the stone taken away from the tomb. This is just amazing. In verse 2, she runneth therefore and come to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Why doesn't he just call himself John? Seriously. You know, it's amazing that the partnership between Peter and John. John is the one that Jesus loved the most, apparently, that Jesus, uh, that uh, John says that because it's in his gospel. But who did he make um, the head of the church? Who did he give the keys to the kingdom to? Peter was the bulldozer. John must have been a nice, you know, really nice person, do you know what I mean? Because opposites often attract. Have you ever noticed in marriages that one is that way and the other one is that way? And what, that's why there's eternal harmony between, you know, uh, husbands and wives for decades. It's just so obvious. But, but the disciple whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, they have what? Taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we know not where they have laid him. The empty tomb should have proved the resurrection, but what did memory, uh, Mary come up with? Grave robbing. That's much more logical. Number two. His numerous recorded appearances after his resurrection to more than 500 people in 17 separate uh, instances. And listen, I'm going to go through them very quickly. Um, First one is the appearance of Christ to Mary Magdalene uh, when she came back to the tomb. The second one is the appearance of Christ to the other women who were coming back and who fell on their faces and, and, and worshipped him. The third appearance was to Peter in the afternoon of the resurrection day. The fourth appearance of Christ was to the disciples as they walked on the road to Emmaus. And boy, I wished I was one of those two. Getting getting a Bible study from Jesus? Give me a break. The fifth appearance was the resurrected Christ to the ten disciples. The sixth appearance uh, was to the eleven disciples a week after his resurrection. I've got all the verses down here. The seventh appearance was to the seven disciples by the Sea of Galilee. Remember Jesus and Peter? uh, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? He he denied him three times and he restored him three times. And the eighth appearance was to the 500 and is recited by Paul as an outstanding proof of his resurrection. The ninth appearance, oh boy, can you imagine this one, was to James, the Lord's brother. Can you imagine him? He never believed him in his ministry, in his life. He was his half-brother of Jesus' humanity. And can you imagine his knees knocking when Jesus appeared to him as the resurrected Messiah, the resurrected Christ? No wonder. Do you know what his nickname was amongst the early patristic fathers? Old Camel Knees. Do you know why? Because after the res- before the resurrection, Jesus, no, nah, after the resurrection, on his knees 18 hours a day. They used to call him old camel knees. 
The tenth appearance was to eleven disciples on a mountain in the Galilee. The eleventh appearance occurred at the time of his ascension from the Mount of Olives. Olives. The twelfth appearance of the resurrected Christ was to Stephen just before his martyrdom in Acts chapter 7. Do you remember that? He gave the, the Pharisees and Sadducees a history lesson that just blew them away. And because of that, they decided, we're going to kill you. And so as they were, you know, polishing up the stones, Stephen looked up and he saw it, I see my Lord standing before the throne of grace. That's amazing. The 13th appearance of Christ was to Paul on the road to Damascus. The 14th appearance seems to have been to Paul in Arabia, and I'm fully um, with that because that's where he got his understanding of all of the New, Te New Testament doctrine that he had to teach in, the, in his 14 letters. The 15th appearance of Christ was to Paul in the temple when Paul is warned concerning the persecution which was to come. The 16th appearance of Christ was to Paul while in prison in Caesarea. And the final and 17th appearance of Christ, can anyone guess? Yeah, to John in Revelation chapter 1. That was the glorified Christ. These others were the resurrected Christ. There's a difference. They all saw him, right? Right? But what did John do when he turned around and saw Jesus? He fell to the ground as if a dead man. He saw the raised, risen, glorified Christ. And by the way, that's who we are going to see. You better have all your T's crossed and all your I's dotted when, when we see him. That's going to be absolutely amazing. Third, his resurrection is proof, proof of his three separate offices. That is of prophet in Deuteronomy 1818. 18. Priest, Psalm 110 verse 4. Thou art a priest after the order of Melchizedek and king. Prophet, priest and king. 2 Samuel 7, 16. When Nathan is speaking to David that his house and his kingdom will be established forever. Without rising from the dead bodily, he, Jesus, could never have finished his obligations as priest and king. Do you understand? Without the resurrection, it, the ministry is, is abruptly stopped. It needs the resurrection. Number four is his ascension to heaven in Acts chapter 1. Acts 1, 8 to 11. This is on the 40th day after his resurrection. In Acts 1, 8 to 11... But ye shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. He's speaking to the ones watching him. And by the way, he's gone to the Mount of Olives, but he's gone on to the Bethany side, not the side where anyone in Jerusalem could see him. Why? And Chuck Missler had a, a, an interesting statement that after his resurrection, only loving hands touched him and only loving eyes saw him. And so that's why the ascension, as far as I'm concerned, was on the lower side, on the other side of the Mount of Olives. It's very interesting, that. And when he had said these, oh, sorry, uh, you'll be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all of Judea, Samaria, and to the utter ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. What received him? A cloud. It's not any old cloud. What happens when you attribute a cloud to the presence of God? It's the Shekinah glory. Do you understand? It's not just a cloud. And it received him out of their sight. And while they were looking steadfastly into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was received up from you into heaven, shall so come in a like manner as ye beheld him going into, into heaven. And that is the uh, second advent. The fifth one, the fifth progression is his return to his pre-incarnate glory, and it's in Daniel 7, 13, and 14. And these verses from Acts 1, 8 to 11 should be jammed together in your understanding that this is the consequence of Jesus' resurrection from the Mount of Olives. Sorry, the ascension from the Mount of Olives. In Daniel 7, 13, it says this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, there came with the what? The clouds of heaven, 
one like a son of man. He disappeared from humanity in the clouds of heaven and he appeared in heaven before the Father in the Shekinah glory. Do you understand? The two of them go together just like that. And he came even to the ancient of days, in this um, context, the Father, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom and that all the peoples and nations and languages should serve him and his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. Praise God for that because we're part of it. We're kings and priests in that. Do you know that what we're in charge of never, will never pass away? Do you understand the things that are waiting you up there? You know, we, we, we suffer in, in various ways down here, but the glory and the destiny that he has for us is beyond our comprehension. Because we're part of that everlasting kingdom. We are raised as the church people to be kings and priests in his kingdom. And it's an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is that which will not be destroyed. The sixth progression is his position at the right hand of the Father, Acts 2.33. Being therefore by the right hand of God... Acts 2.33, you got it? Don't worry about it, I'll read it out. Being therefore by the right hand of God exalted, you see, exalted, he now has received all of those things in, in Daniel 7.13 and 14, his exaltation, he now sits at the right hand of God, exalted again with the, uh, with the glory that he had before he came to earth. And having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he hath poured forth this which you see and hear. The seventh progression is his second coming to the earth in power and glory. These are the progressions, not his offices. We're going to look at the offices in a minute. His second coming to earth in power and glory. And glory. Revelation 19, 11 to 16, verse 11. And I saw the heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat thereon, called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. So what's he coming to make war with? The Antichrist, the false priest, the kings of the earth, and the armies of the earth. And they are waiting to go to war with him. Can you... Un it's just beyond belief that mortal human beings can believe that they can take on God. But do you know what? In the intellect of too many false uh, liberal theologians, they think they can. They think they can adjust this book to suit them. No, you're supposed to be adjusted to suit it. And his eyes are a flame of fire, and upon his head are many diadems, thank goodness, because that's the ruling crown. The other one is the Stephanus, which is an athletic, athletics crown. And he has a name written which no one knows but himself. And he is arrayed in a garment sprinkled with blood. And if you let me go on that one, we'll be here till six o'clock. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses. That's you and me. That's you and me. The angels and us. We're the only ones that can come back with him. The rest of them haven't been resurrected yet. That waits till Revelation 20, 1 through to 4. We're there on horses coming back to the earth because we've already been married to him in the, in the ceremony up in heaven. That's in the 75-day um, um, interval between the, uh, the coming of Jesus and the inauguration of the uh, kingdom. And the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and pure. And out of his mouth proceeded a, proceeded a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Uh, iron. Give me a break. And a rod of uh, Ireland? But anyway, <laughs> that's where a lot of the crucifixes used to be. But anyway, out of his iron. And my wife is telling me off because I, I get very dry. Thank you. And he treads the winepress of the fairness, see that's better, uh, of the wrath of God and the Almighty. And he hath on his garment and on his thigh a name. And if I don't get a hallelujah, King of kings and Lord of lords. He's our boss. 
The eighth progression is this. He's taking up the occupancy of the throne of David in the millennial kingdom as ruler over all the earth in Psalm 2, 6 to 8. This is the father saying, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Notice this. Everyone gets the ownership of the land of Israel wrong. It does not belong to the Jewish people. Because seven times in the Tanakh, God says it is what? My land. The Jews are tenants in perpetuity. There's a big difference. And here in Psalm 2, God the Father is saying, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill, not their holy hill. Do you see? Words are important. Aren't they, Augusto, in legal documents? You can lose a whole case by putting one wrong word in one rod phrase. That's why I am like this with the Bible. It's absolutely brilliant. And verse 7, this is Jesus. I will tell of the decree. Jehovah, yod heh vav said unto me, Thou art my son. This day I have begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will give thee the nations for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy, thy possession. His exaltation in, in the ninth uh, stage is as the supreme judge of all mankind. And Revelation 20, 11 to 15. And I saw a great white throne and him, Jesus, that sat on it. And by the way, we're there too from 1 Corinthians 6. We judge both the world and angels. Give me a break. Who, from whose face the earth and heaven fled, fled away. I'm sure there's many... Um, demons and people in the earth who, if they knew that we'd be judging them, they might lift their game. Do you know what I mean? Uh, and earth and heaven fled away, and there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, the small and the great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. Does it ever say according to their faith? What are they trying to do? Satisfy him with works. That is the difference between Cain and Abel. His tenth one, oh sorry, and, and the death and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was also cast into the lake of fire. And that whosoever is very uh, important. I could spend two hours just doing that one verse. And the tenth progression is this: his exaltation with the Father in ruling over the new heavens and the new earth. You see. The resurrection of Jesus 2,000 years ago extends right to the new heavens and the new earth. Without that, there would have been no new heavens and earth. Do you understand? It's that critical to it. And I saw a new heaven. And by the way, I heard someone else uh, on, on a YouTube during the week. I wasn't listening to it. I, it was just playing. And, and they say, oh, new heaven. Well, they might regenerate this one. What does it say in the verse? And I saw a new heaven. That word in Greek is kairos. And do you know what kairos means? It means new, fresh, and unused. So it hasn't been redone um, up, flossied up. It's a new heaven and a new earth. And the first earth has passed away. Don't they ever read the Bible? Do you know what? I, I, I'm, I'm so sure that they don't that parts they don't like, they just skim over. And sometimes when, when you're reading the scriptures, and especially ones that you think you know, you read over them without letting them sit in here for a while. Every word and every verse is vital. And not only that, the punctuation is as well. And the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. 
And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, finally, mankind. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Can you imagine? Can you imagine God the Father finally, because you can see him now, because you are like him, Right now, he dwells in unapproachable light. None of us can see him. Jesus can see him. But in 1 Timothy 6.16, he dwells in an uh, uh, untouchable light. But can you you imagine being in the new heavens and the new earth, and there's just tears of joy on your face, and he comes down and he just gets his divine thumb and just takes that tear away? Can you imagine that? For the first time, you will understand the magnitude of the Father's love for you. We often look about Jesus and Jesus' sacrifice and his love for us, but it was the Father's love that sent him to the earth to do everything that we needed to be with him in the new heavens and the new earth. And he sat upon the throne and said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, John, for these words are true and faithful. And this is focusing in on Jesus in this particular situation. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give to him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life, life freely. Without the resurrection and exaltation of Jesus... He could never have entered into his present ministry in several ways. He's now the Alpha and Omega in the new heavens and the new earth. But between then and his resurrection, he had existing ministry, which required the resurrection. Do you get it? It requires it. And the first one is sending the Holy Spirit. John 16, verse 7, and this is in the upper room discourse. He tells the disciples, the 11, Judas is already gone. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I do not go away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Therefore, the promise of the Spirit is to continue the ministry that Jesus initiated during his first advent, providing spiritual gifts to men, empowering them to perform miracles as to Jesus, and to provide illumination of the scriptures, and allowing them, therefore, to teach others in the same way that the Lord had taught them. And the second one, the second ministry, is bestowing eternal life on those who believe. John 11, 25 to 26. And Jesus said, in verse 25, this is to Martha. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall what? Never die. Believest thou this? That is one of the most poignant verses in the Bible for me. Because uh, in 2005, uh, my younger brother died. uh, And I had to go back for his funeral. And I was, um, you know, can I say a Chuck Missilerite Christian by then? About as explosive and bulldozery that I could get. And I sat in my brother's um, funeral and the family gets the front seat, and there was a celebrant there, nice lady, and she said, Philip hasn't really died. He's just re-entered the circle of life. And the stupidest thing she ever said was after that, would any member of the family like to say something? (laughs) So Stuart hopped up, And gave the whole congregation that. I am the resurrection and the life that he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. 
and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And there was stunned silence. And um, there were members of my family and members of Sue's family there who remembered me in my pre-Christian days and they just had shock on their faces. But that's the transforming power of faith in Jesus Christ. I don't claim that, but I was never going to let that woman get away with my brother re-entering the circle of life. Give me a break. And a little Baptist, a tiny little guy, a little bald Baptist um, came up to me afterwards. He was sitting right at the back of the room. He had tears down his eyes, and he just grasped, uh, I, he just took my hands in his like this, and he said, thank you, thank you, thank you for telling the truth. The third office is head of the church, Ephesians 1, 19 to 23. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power? That's the Father, mind you. I love getting people who, are, who say to me, can you teach me how to ex exegete the Bible? I always give them Ephesians 1. Until they get it right, they don't go any further because it's the most difficult passage to, to, to exegete if you don't understand the pronouns. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power, the Father, to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power, the Father, which he wrought in Christ? Do you see? The Father wrought all of that in Christ. When he, the Father, raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places far above all principality, power, might, and dominion. That's the angelic realm. And every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And he, he has put all things, this is the Father, has put all things under his, Jesus' feet, and gave him, Jesus, to be the head over all things to the church, which is... His body, Jesus' body, the fullness of him that finish, f filleth all in all. You know, when we say that Jesus is the head of the church, we've got no, on, uh, no idea. Is anyone here that's got a head that's separated from the body around about here? No. We're all joined. We're all one body. We're all one life. We're one organism we're the church and he's the head and we're the body and if you dwell on that it'll blow your mind why us why us in this dispensation when I look at the heroes of faith in the old testament you only have to go through Hebrews chapter 11 to look at some of them why us Mind you, are you going to give your seat up to anyone else? You know, <laughs> everyone would say, oh, oh, well, I might if I asked nightly. I don't think so. Christ as our advocate. Oh, thank goodness we've got an ag advocate. It's pertinent that Augusto is here because that means lawyer. He's our defense lawyer beside the Father. Hebrews 7, 24 to 25. But he, Jesus, because he abideth forever, hath his priesthood unchangeable. Wherefore he is all, always able to save to the uttermost them that draw near unto God through him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Do you understand that? Who made a boo-boo yesterday in thought, speech or deed are oh, you fibbers <laughs> Sue there's some perfect people here that's amazing <laughs> absolutely amazing do you know what Jesus does in intercession for us in Ezekiel it says the soul that sinneth must die do you understand because of his justice his holiness and his righteousness he cannot tolerate sin so how did he fix it he fixed it through Jesus because Jesus paid for all of our boo-boos, every single one of them. He paid for them on that cross. And now that he has been resurrected, raised up, exalted, 
seated beside the Father as our defence lawyer, do you know what happens? When you make a boo-boo, Jesus turns to the Father and says, charge that to my account. Do you understand? He paid, he paid it all. What a brilliant choice of songs, boy. And he didn't know what I was talking about, but there it is, Jesus paid it all. Charge that to my account. That's the amazing thing. And fifth, raising church-age believers to a new position in Christ. Ephesians 2, 1 to 6. And you did he, God the Father, do you understand? God the Father, make alive when you were dead through your trespasses and sins wherein you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the powers of the air, of the spirit that now worketh in the sons of disobedience. That's what we were like before we came to faith. Do you understand? No one was born righteous. You know, we've got this little grandson at the moment, you know, and we had our own kids. Aren't they just, just beautiful as little babies? But you're a sinner. Do you know what I mean? You're born in sin. You need Jesus, Ari. Not you, our grandson. He was named after you. <laughs> Ariel means Lion of Judah. And uh, give me a break. Uh, our kids, all, all of our three grands, uh, grandchildren have uh, Jewish names, Josiah, Odea, and Ariel. We're moving to Israel fairly soon. Um, <laughs> When you were dead through your trespasses and sins, wherein you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that now worketh in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also once lived in the lusts of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as at rest. But God, the Father, being rich in his mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. Even when we were dead through our trespasses, he made us alive with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and made us sit with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And if I can't get a hallelujah... Revelation chapter 4, there's the throne, there's Jesus, and there's 24 elders seated around the throne. Who's that? That's us. That's us. Remember in Ezekiel 28, Satan wanted to be where? He wanted to lift his throne up to the same height as God. That's what he wanted to do in pride. And he got cast out of heaven forever lost and yet you and I get the privilege, that privilege simply by being in Jesus Christ. And who did all of the work? The Father. Do you not get it? My, part of my passionate ministry is to get you back to the Father. Through Jesus, not instead of Jesus. Through Jesus. Because the Father did everything. He planned everything. His universal decree was that he would have a family with him in eternity. And the whole Bible writes the text, how he did it. Created the universe, created the earth, created man. They stuffed up, created the righteousness that was needed to re uh, repair that through faith in the Redeemer that would come. Do you know why? It's fascinating that in Genesis chapter 4, Abel, the righteous one, knew that it took the shedding of innocent blood to come into the presence of God. He sacrificed the firstlings of his flock, a lamb, and took that and the, por the fat portions thereof to the altar before God. Because he didn't produce the lamb, God produced the lamb. God is the source and author of all life. So it was God's lamb, Abraham's uh, sh uh, uh, 
killed it, innocent blood, and that what was what was needed to go into the presence of God. What did uh, Cain take? Fruit and veg. The works of his own hands. The summation. Yeah, I've got the time to do the summation. This is incredible. Uh, here it is here. It has been summarized that the importance of the resurrection is in these words. His resurrection is vitally related to the ages past, to the fulfillment of all prophecy, to the values of his death, to the church, to Israel, to creation, to the purposes of God and grace, which reach beyond the ages to come, and to the eternal glory of God. Fulfillment of the eternal purposes related to all of these was dependent upon the coming forth of the Son of God from that tomb. He arose from the dead, and the greatness of that event is indicated by its important place in Christian doctrine. I put it at the top of Christian doctrine, because without that, we are still yet in our sins. Had not Christ arisen, he, by, all, by whom all things were created, every divine purpose and blessing would have failed. And the very universe and the throne of God would have dissolved and would have been dismissed forever. All life, light and hope would have ceased. Death, darkness and despair would have reigned. Though the spiritual powers of darkness might have continued the last hope for a ruined world would have been banished eternally. It is impossible for the mind to grasp the mighty issues which were at stake at the moment when Christ came forward from the tomb. At no moment of time, however, were these great issues ever in, je in jeopardy. The consummation of his resurrection was sure because of the omnipotent power of God the Father to bring it to pass. Every feature of the Christian's salvation, position and hope was dependent on the resurrection of our Lord. Like other important prophecies which have been fulfilled, the resurrection of Christ is another confirmation of the accuracy and the infallibility of the Scriptures and is a testimony, as a testimony to its inspiration by the Holy Spirit. The resurrection of Christ fulfilled many prophecies, both in the Old and New Testaments. Of importance in the, in the Old Testament is Psalm 1610, which is, I know that you will not allow your uh, Holy One to see decay. And that's why, why did Jesus have to rise on the third day? How many days was Lazarus in the grave? In John 11. And what did his sister say to Jesus? Because Jesus said, roll a stone away. And Martha said, but Lord, he stinketh. You see, Jewish theology held this, that from the fourth day onwards, the body started to break down. That's why he rose again on the third day. That's why the third day was made the Feast of first fruits because it would have been an offence for him to be in the grave any longer. Do you get that? It's all in the Bible. Oh, yeah. this, I, I'm a, I got accused a long time ago by a quite famous pastor in, uh, in, the, in the Perth church because uh, he said something a bit strange, and I said, but that's not in the Bible. And he said to me, oh, you must be a biblicist. And I said, thank you. <laughs> As Peter points out, this promise could not have been fulfilled by David who died and the tomb was known to them at the time of Peter's statements. It could only refer to Jesus Christ whose body did not see corruption. In the New Testament narrative, Christ frequently referred to his coming death and resurrection, and these predictions again had their fulfillment when Christ rose from the dead. 
The resurrection of Christ is therefore to be numbered among the major undertakings of God the Father, which include his original decree, the creation of the physical world, the incarnation, the death of Christ, and his second coming to the earth. And can I have a hallelujah? Father, we just thank you now that you have revealed to us through your word, not man's intellect, not man's in imagination, Father, but through your word, your written word, sustained since the creation of the world, Father, that where Moses recorded the Tanakh. Father, we just thank you now that we have the sure word of God as our foundation and as our strength and our belief in the truth of what you have promised to us as your children in this dispensation, the dispensation of the church, being the body of Christ, beloved by Jesus, beloved by you. And Father, I just cannot wait to see you. Father, I know that you have your purposes, that until the very last person is saved in this dispensation, we have to be here. But Father, give us the strength and the moral courage to be the salt and the light that you have demanded that we be in these last days. And Father, I have seen that these last days has brought so many people to faith in Jesus Christ because of the times that we were living in. It's the best of times, Father, and it's the worst of times. But Father, it's all to your glory. And all God's people said, 